in addition to research, we actually also do a significant amount of training. So we wanted, I wanted to highlight that the Simulation Innovation Lab actually works on training residents, medical students, and also actually faculty uh, during this time. Um, we have a lab that actually, so two parts of the lab. The first lab is a very sophisticated 3D printing lab, um, and it does have some of the state-of-the-art 3D printers. We, we did get a New York State uh, $500,000 grant last year, uh, in addition to the NIH grants that we do also get. But also, more importantly, we actually not only have a simulator in the OR, we have a dedicated, fully functional XI robot uh, with its simulator in a room that is replicating an OR. Um, and we use this exclusively for resident training in addition to research and development. Um, I, uh, uh, we have a curriculum that for simulation training, something I developed during my master's of education, and it's very similar to take for principles that we adopted from aviation training. What we do is we teach through the skills that are required, the basic skills using a VR curriculum that we have developed. We use video coaching and didactic lectures um, to give you the knowledge. And every Wednesday, residents do have their educational day. And it's actually run now by residents. I started in my first couple of years as a junior faculty. And now the residents actually run it. And I just had a resident in the OR that said, it's very, uh, it's something that is excellent when I try to teach my junior residents, he's a chief, uh, how to do a prostatectomy. And I learn a lot out of that also. Uh, but we also wanted to do full procedural simulation, and this is where the lab came in, and our, our essential goal is zero time operative training. So the residents in the beginning of their research year go through this curriculum, and by their fifth year, they're doing procedures skin to skin because of this curriculum. Um, to highlight some of how we do this, so this is our radical prostatectomy model. It won uh, first prize at the AUA in 2016 as a video abstract, and just next to it is actually our prostatectomy model, which I'm going to highlight um, also won an award in actually one of the upstate um, competitions that was mentioned earlier. Um, what we try to do is we try to use 3D printing and hydrogel modeling. And to tell you the truth, this is not available anywhere. Uh, you know, I don't want to brag, but in the world, uh, people from, we have agreements with UCL, uh, University College London, with AMRO, which is the Robotics Institute of Australia, in addition to Hopkins, these are all research agreements that allow us to actually use our uh, models to do multi-institutional training studies. Um, and a lot of people have requested these models. We, we are very unique in what we do. Uh, the most important thing is actually residents get involved in, the, in not only the building process, but in the development process. And I'll, I'll explain that later down the road. Um, not to take too much of your time, but one of the essential components of these models is their procedural. You, you do them skin to skin, from putting the trocars in to retrieving the specimen. Here was something that was very interesting. We, we actually model these out of patient CT scans, so they're specific models to patients. And there was an aberrant artery, and one of the residents actually found that aberrant artery by mistake, injured it. And they were like, I want to convert, I want to stop. I was like, no, this is the time where you learn how to actually deal with intraoperative bleeding. So they went in, controlled the bleeder, got that whip stitch in and started actually correcting the bleeding. And, and they came out drenched with sweat and saying, this is the most realistic experience I've ever had. So not only do we teach you actually the procedure, but we teach you how to deal with the complications associated with it. Uh, this is a side-to-side -side comparison of one of the difficult patient-specific simulations we did. We do these for faculty, but we also do these for residents. You know, they're never going to get to do a six centimeter posterior hilar tumor with a nephrometry score of 10x um, while they're residents. Uh, although actually some of them do, but the idea is they can actually do it in simulation. So if you notice the similarity between both of these, the live surgery and the simulation, the, the residents actually get to do these very difficult cases. We have a library now of 100 patient-specific models, and they get to go in, and after they do the curriculum, they get to say, well, you know, I want to do this hilar tumor that Dr. Rashid did, or this difficult uh, case that was done by Dr. Joseph or any of our oncologists, and basically what we do is we make a model for them, and they go in, and they actually start to do the procedure and learn from it. Um, we also have them actually inspect their models at the end, and it's very insightful to see how close you got to the margins, how close you got to the pelvic calcial system, what segmental arteries you could have um, you could have clamped. Some residents say, "I'm you know I'm going to do a, a, a partial ischemia on this or selective ischemia, something that they would feel is risky to do in the OR, but here in the simulation world they can actually do it from skin to skin." So um, this is an example of what we want to take it to the next level. You know, you're never going to encounter a crisis event uh, except when you're an attending and you're in control. So what we do is we've replicated an emergency hand docking scenario. And this is an entire scenario. I'm just showing you the exciting parts of it. 
and there's a heart rate monitor in the back if you can hear that, and that's denoting the patient's heart rate. And what we've done is we've created this retroperitoneal tumor that bleeds, and now they actually have to go in, grab the pedicle, and when they do that, we hit, uh, we fault the actual robot, and we have a way of, we've hacked into our robot and enabled us to do that because it's a dedicated training robot. And this is, of course, after um, getting permission from Intuitive. And after we were able to do that, they actually have to open, convert, get in there, control the bleeder with their hand, and then use the what we call the instrument release kit. And I don't know if any of you have heard of this. This is a kit that is available in every single one of our ORs in a specific location, and people don't know where it is. And we've had faculty also do it. And they get to undock the robot, convert, and, and we get to tell them how much their blood loss is. And after they go through an online curriculum, they get to repeat that all over again. Um, again, this was something that won an award at the World Congress of Endurology. Th this is where it was really exciting to me. Um, Mike Whithouse, uh, one of our residents that actually matched um, in the, the Reconstructive Fellowship at U UC um, SD, uh, actually wanted you in his research here to build an IPP, an intraprenal prosthesis model. He felt that that was something that we're deficient in training, we're using cadavers, and he wanted to get out of it. Our, our lab you know, has the capability of building that. So he worked with myself, reconstructive surgeons, our engineers, and Dr. Ricardo Menares in Boston University. He is a graduate of Boston University, who's his previous mentor when he was medical school. And he actually built this model. Not only did this model you know, get published, but it won several awards. And this is something he took from the beginning of his research here and has endorsed it ever since. And now is you know, flying around with these models, trying to get multi-institutional data to enable us to see how well we can use this to train residents. And it's incredible what he's achieved and he's truly proud of it. Um, to give you an idea of what he's won, so um, he actually was participating in his research in the prostatectomy model, he validated it, um, and he, we actually won an award um, uh, in, upstate, in the upstate competition for that. We, he published on the IPP model um, in the Journal of Sexual Medicine. Uh, we actually won an award this last AUA uh, in one of the top 10 videos for that intrapenile prosthesis model. But what the highlight of his presentation was when he presented this at the SMSNA, this was a tweet that came out from the Journal of Sexual Medicine. And he was saying the future of IPP training is here. Dr. Whithouse presents his model on intrapenile prosthetic simulation and its applicability. And he won first prize for that. He called me that day, I was in the conference, and he was so excited about being recognized at such a level that you know, the future of training is here, something that he helped build from the fruition to the end. And it helped him, I, I presume it helped him network, it helped him be able to talk to people and help him actually match in a fellowship that, a highly competitive fellowship that he wanted to match in. Taking this to the next level, one of the really cool things that we do is this lab also is engaged in medical student learning. We did what we call an experiential learning experience. This was actually one of my master's um, projects. And what we did is we built a laparoscopic cholecystectomy model where the, where the medical students, 30 medical students, had to read up on how to do a cholecystectomy, had to watch it in the OR, had to fill in a template of how to do the cholecystectomy, and then actually got to do a cholecystectomy with minimal guidance. We had 16 students. We were standing there. We actually had them go from the beginning to the end. And the comments we got is that through this, what we call an experiential learning experience, where you give them enough pre-learning and actually allow them to experiment in a template and then have them actually do the procedure, they got a better understanding of the procedure. They felt that this was the most exciting 30, part of the third year clerkship. And the feedback that we got from them from these open-ended questions where we use qualitative research was incredible. We're actually submitting this to JAX. Um, and we are building a transrectal ultrasound model currently, which the students that actually sign up for our virtual clerkship, we ship the models over to them. And then we have them do this, that same experiential learning experience so that they can actually learn how to do a transrectal ultrasound biopsy before they even start doing their, um, their, their, their before they start, you know, uro being urology interns. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but if any of you want to connect with me, um, this is my Twitter's account and the lab's Twitter's account, my email, and also we do have a website dedicated to the lab. It's SIL, which is simulationinnovationlab.urmc.edu. Thank you.